Video games come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. You have big blockbuster releases to smaller releases. And as someone who loves to collect video games, I have played a lot of video games over the years. Everything from Atari 2600 up until modern consoles. And as someone who's played a lot of video games, there's a lot of video games out there that I feel are just underrated. Games that people don't talk about. Maybe it came out on a weird system. Maybe the game itself was just too weird. Or maybe people were just weren't expecting this sort of game to come out on a particular system. So in today's video, I have 11 different games across a multitude of various platforms that I want to talk about that I feel are underrated. And I'm going to talk about why I feel these games are underrated as well, why these games aren't still talked about today, and why these games just sort of flew under the radar. So sit back, relax, make sure you subscribe to the channel, and let's talk about 11 underrated games that are worth playing. Hey, RGT85, hey Sean. Oh my God, it's Stevie Richards! Now some of the games that we're going to cover in this video are games that I've actually talked about on the channel before. Some of these games are going to be first timers. One game that I have talked about on the channel before is a DS game that I absolutely love. It was absolutely fantastic when it first came out, but it's severely underrated. And that is Fighting Fantasy, The Warlock of Firetop Mountain. Now this is a very interesting game for fans of older Elder Scrolls games. If you like first person dungeon crawling games, this game really needs to be in your Nintendo DS collection. You basically start out in a town, you equip different weapons, and get different spells and then you go into this cave and you're trying to get to the top of Firetop Mountain and take out the Warlock, kind of hence the name of the game. But this game was honestly very impressive. You had a very smooth first person engine in which you would look around and go throughout this caverns and go into different caves and stuff and take out enemies. Now enemies were 2D sprites, sort of like in Hexen 64 on the Nintendo 64. But still, they were varied. There was a lot of different characters and creatures that you would come across. There was a lot of customization with your character in this game as well. Whether you wanted to be a swordsman and take out enemies that way, focus more on magic, or be a blend of different characters, you could really do that in this game. It was pretty challenging challenging, but I really had a lot of fun with this game. So why is this game so severely underrated? Why does nobody ever talk about this game? I can't really pinpoint it, but I do think I have one reason as to why. Now you gotta remember, this game came out in the mid-2000s, sort of when video game magazines were phasing out. YouTube hadn't really caught on, so there weren't a lot of people reviewing games on YouTube. So really, most of the major publications that were reviewing games were, of course, websites. And IGN did a scathing review on this game, saying it was just absolutely horrible. And I'm not saying that that's the sole reason reason, but I honestly feel like that did play a major part because at that time IGN was arguably the biggest video gaming website in the world. They just didn't like this game and I can't quite pinpoint why because I think this game is absolutely fantastic. If you're a Nintendo DS owner, it is a bit of a pricey game, but if you love first person dungeon crawlers, this is a must own in my opinion. If you're a fan of older Elder Scrolls games, it's one of the most underrated DS games of all time and a game I absolutely love. The next game I want to talk about is a Dreamcast game that I absolutely love that nobody ever really talks about, and that is D2. Now, D2 is a game that was released by Warp, and if you're not familiar with Warp, they basically did games like D and, of course, Enemy Zero on the Sega Saturn. And I really enjoyed these games, but they were definitely a bit weird for the time frame that they came out in. And D2 really took that weirdness to a whole nother level. Following a plane crash, you find yourself in a cabin, and you're basically trying to survive. Figure out what the hell happened, why the plane went down, even though there was some weird shaman dude dude saying shadow the final destroyer shadow the final destroyer in the back of the plane which should have been a red flag but it wasn't but this game was really unique in how it really sort of blended different genres together basically when you're in the caverns and you're in a first person perspective and you're looking around and you're basically sort of in a point and click like setting but once you go outside there's a lot of different stuff to do you have to hunt animals in order to keep your uh, stamina up and basically the way you do this is you move in a third person perspective and then switch into a first person perspective so it was really unique and sort of a blending of different genres. There were survival elements. There, of course, was survival horror elements, as this was a horror game with a pretty sick and twisted plot line. There were big creatures that you had to take out as well, some really fun boss battles, and it was just a really unique game, and I really feel like it was just too unique for the time. Something like this could probably fly in 2019, and people would be able to appreciate it. But back then, games just sort of followed a more standard technique, I felt. So this game just really flew under a lot of people's radars. It still looks really good. It still plays really good. And if you're a fan of games like survival horror games, it is a must play in my opinion. One of the finest Dreamcast games and one of my favorite Dreamcast games. If you're a fan of sort of weird survival horror games, definitely give this game a chance because it's a super underrated game.
One of the biggest fighting franchises of the 90s was of course Mortal Kombat, and Mortal Kombat 2 is arguably one of the best fighting sequels of all time. It took everything from the original game and improved upon it. You had more characters, you had more secret characters, you had more levels to play on, you had more moves, more fatalities. It was just a fantastic evolution of the original Mortal Kombat game, and is still considered by many to be the best version of Mortal Kombat out there, being Mortal Kombat 2. And of course, after the arcade success of the game, it was ported to a multitude of different platforms. Most of us played this game on the 16-bit system, like the Super Nintendo or the Sega Genesis. I myself actually had this game on the Game Boy, and I used to play it in church and like burn people alive with Scorpion because, I, I don't know, I liked playing Mortal Kombat 2. So how could Mortal Kombat 2 be an underrated game though? Everyone knows Mortal Kombat 2. Well, did you know that the best home version of Mortal Kombat 2 during that time era is a game that nobody absolutely talks about, and that is Mortal Kombat 2 on the 32X. Now, of course, this system, like I said, this game was ported to a multitude of systems, but really to get the best arcade experience, you had to play it on the 32X. Sure, the game also released on the Sega Saturn, but there was a major flaw with the Sega Saturn version. Whenever you played as Shang Tsung and you wanted to change to another character, which is what Shang Tsung was known for, the game had to load, and that really took a lot of gamers out of the experience. There was also loading times for a lot of different things as well when you're playing in between rounds and of course when you're trying to do fatalities. But Mortal Kombat 2 on the 32X was the best home version of this game. The sprites were big, there was additional sound effects not featured in the 16-bit versions of the game. The backgrounds were much more detailed, and you did not have to worry about the loading times of the Sega Saturn version. This is a criminally underrated version of Mortal Kombat 2, and the reason it's underrated is because it came out on the 32X. I was one of the weirdos who had a 32X during its heyday, but most people did not have a 32X. And honestly, that's kind of what's one of the driving forces behind my book, is because there's a lot of great 32X games that people don't talk about. A severely underrated port, the best home port during the 90s for Mortal Kombat 2, and a game that you absolutely must play if you are a hardcore Mortal Kombat fan. The NES, of course, was home to a bunch of different awesome games. You, of course, have games like Contra, Double Dragon, Super Mario Bros. 3, but one of the most underrated NES games of all time has to be Nightshade. Now, Nightshade was a very, very unique game that absolutely blew my mind when I first played it, and is still very impressive today. It's another game that sort of combines different elements and different genres of games, including genres of games that we hadn't really seen at the time. It starts out as a point-and-click adventure game, where you're basically trying to figure out how to solve this puzzle and avoid dying. And then and once you do that, you basically have a bit of a free roam to yourself. You could search different things, solve different puzzles. It feels kind of like a bit like a Maniac Mansion game. But once you get out of the initial area, you realize this is like an open world game. There's tons of different areas to explore. The graphics look really nice. There's all sorts of liveliness going on within this city. And it's just such a deep game with an interesting narrative of what is going on within this world that it absolutely just sucks you in. It is very challenging, but I feel like this game is severely underrated because once again, like D2, it's sort of a blending of genres that you hadn't really seen, and the initial puzzle can be very tricky, so I feel like a lot of younger gamers and gamers at that time never really got past that initial stage. Without things like game facts and of course walkthroughs, which are readily available nowadays, this game would have been very challenging to play, but Nightshade is an absolutely underrated NES classic. It's honestly one of the finest games on the system, and if you're an NES fan, you'll probably have this in your library, so go ahead and play it. The Sega Genesis had tons of great platformer games, but one platforming game that gets no respect whatsoever has to be Garfield Caught in the Act. Now, Garfield Caught in the Act was a very important game to me because growing up, I absolutely loved Garfield. I used to watch Garfield and Friends every day. I used to do the dance to the intro song and everything. I absolutely loved Garfield. So when Garfield was getting his own game, I was very, very interested in it. And Garfield Caught in the Act is an absolutely fantastic Sega Genesis game that gets no respect. Garfield Caught in the Act is basically a game where Garfield is sucked to a TV along with Odie, and he must go through different sorts of levels that are basically things like vampire-based levels, there's a Casablanca-based level, a prehistoric-based level, cliche video game levels that you would see in sort of TV shows. But what really makes this game stand out to me is the animation in this game. The animation and graphics in this game are second to none on the Sega Genesis. I feel like there's such great graphical variety in the levels, in the character designs, and the animations of the characters themselves. It really feels like a cartoon at times, and it's absolutely fantastic. The game is pretty challenging, but I absolutely love it. I feel like this game was a bit underrated because it sort of came out near
near the tail end of the Sega Genesis's life cycle. A lot of people were looking forward to the upcoming platform, so they sort of slept on this game. But it's an absolutely fantastic game. It's a pretty cheap game to pick up as well. So if you're a fan of 2D platformers and you own a Sega Genesis, Garfield Caught in the Act is a super underrated game that you definitely need to check out. Another great game from the mid-2000s has to be Indigo Prophecy. Now this game actually sold pretty well when it initially came out. A lot of people were excited for it and it got pretty positive reviews, but since the initial release of the game, nobody seems to talk about it. You never see it pop up and that's a damn shame because Indigo Prophecy honestly is a pretty revolutionary game in the world of console video games for a multitude of reasons. Indigo Prophecy was sort of what we've started to become accustomed to with sort of interactive movies with a lot of modern day experiences. Games were where you don't really necessarily control the character, but you control what the character does and thinks and how they react to different people. And this game really brought that sort of gameplay into the limelight. It's a supernatural thriller in which people in New York City are becoming possessed by different spirits and then killing people randomly. So you play as a different cast of characters, basically trying to figure out what is going on. And you basically talk to different people, you get different clues, you go into different areas. It's just a very, very unique game. And at the time, like I said, it was well received. A lot of critics seemed to enjoy the game. It sold pretty decently as well, but ever since then, the game never seems to get any sort of respect. It's definitely a mind-bending thriller with multiple areas to go through, multiple branching story paths, and even multiple endings, so it's worth playing the game through a couple different times if you want to get all the different endings and get a conclusion to the story. It's definitely a gripping narrative if you're a fan of sci-fi stuff, and Indigo Prophecy is an absolutely fantastic game. I want to see more people talk about Indigo Prophecy, because just for whatever reason, they don't. I guess because there's better cinematic experiences out there nowadays in the world of video games that the grandfather of these experiences just kind of gets overlooked, but it definitely shouldn't be. The Nintendo Wiimote really lended itself for a lot of different genres where you could do a lot of different things and motion controls sort of took on, but I feel like one of the best instances of motion controls in the early days of the Wii was the Conduit, a first person shooter that absolutely was just so much fun to me when I played it back in the day, and it's just a game that once again is very underappreciated. One of the main drawing points of the Conduit was the fact that this was a pretty graphically pleasing looking game. You didn't really see many companies out there really trying to push the Wii, but the Conduit had a lot of impressive effects, it had a lot of impressive environments, and it had a lot of impressive different aliens that you were blasting your way through. It's once again another sci-fi based game where you're going through different real world locations and having to take out different aliens and things like that, and of course companies that are trying to harbor these aliens and keep them from getting at you. It's a really unique game, and one of the things I really enjoyed about the game was that you had full customization over the controls. You could customize everything from the dead zone to how you controlled the character and pretty much everything in between. It also had online gameplay as well that utilized the Nintendo Wii Speak, so you could actually talk to people. And the online, while pretty basic, was actually pretty fun. The Conduit was kind of a bit of a standard experience in terms of storytelling, but if you actually looked for hidden elements within the game, you actually got a deeper narrative that really sort of opened up the world that you were playing in. The game ended up getting a sequel, and while the sequel was still good, I didn't really like how it just sort of went overboard with the over-the-top elements of this game. This game felt a bit more real world to me. The Conduit is one of my favorite first-person shooters of all time, a fantastic Wii game and just an underrated game because not really many people played first person shooters on the Wii. But if you own a Wii, it's a very cheap game and a game I definitely recommend picking up. I'm a big fan of pro wrestling, and subsequently, I'm a big fan of pro wrestling games. And one of the most underrated pro wrestling games of all time to me has to be WWE Legends of WrestleMania. Now, this game released on the Xbox 360 and the PS3, but this game was very unique in how the game actually played. At the time, you had games like WWE SmackDown vs. Raw, which was a long-running series that was very popular. It tried to be somewhat realistic in portraying how wrestling worked. But WWE Legends of WrestleMania went in a completely different direction. It played more like the arcade WWE games or WWF games of yesteryear, games like WrestleFest and things like that. Of course, being Legends of WrestleMania, you had a lot of older characters from the 80s and 90s, essentially the heyday of professional wrestling for a lot of people. The gameplay was fast and frantic. The characters themselves were a bit over-exaggerated of how they actually looked, but I really liked it. The graphics were very clean and crisp, and the gameplay, like I said, was very fast. It wasn't like a sort of simulation wrestling game. It definitely played a lot like an arcade wrestling game. One of the cool things you could do in this 
game was if you had an imported save file for SmackDown vs. Raw 2009, you could actually bring those characters over into this game. And it really made for some very interesting situations. You had classic wrestlers versus modern wrestlers. There was a story mode as well, which had different video clips of different WrestleMania moments, and it was just really well done. You could actually relive these moments, rewrite these moments as well with different outcomes. Just a very well done wrestling game. The reason I feel that this game flew under the radar was because it was just so based more on action than sort of a simulation. People wanted something a bit more refined. People wanted something a bit more realistic, I feel. But if you're a fan of action-based wrestling games and you like the arcade feel, WWE Legends of WrestleMania is an absolutely fantastic game that nobody ever talks about, and I definitely recommend checking it out. Grand Theft Auto 3 really started to spawn a lot of open world games, and there's been a ton of great open world games over the years, but one of my favorite that definitely flies a bit under the radar has to be LEGO City Undercover. Now this released on a multitude of systems, including the Nintendo Wii U, and of course the Nintendo Switch, but LEGO City Undercover is a fantastic open world experience that not a lot of people talk about, but I definitely think I know why. LEGO City Undercover has you playing as a cop, basically solving different crimes, and trying to find out what's going on in the world of LEGO City. It's a really open and robust game and there's a lot of different areas to go to and a lot of different vehicles you can customize. There's customizable vehicles, you can get different costumes and different abilities for your main character and subsequent versions of the game actually let you play the game with a friend in local split screen mode. The world that you play in is very fun, there's a lot of different areas, there's a lot of different hidden secrets and the, although it is a Lego game at its core which means that you're basically building blocks and smashing things in a lot of the gameplay, it still felt fresh enough to differentiate itself from the other style of Lego games. What I really liked about Lego City Undercover was the writing though. There was tons of pop culture references and just a lot of funny dialogue and a lot of funny moments within this game. So why is this game so underrated? Because it's a Lego game and I feel like the kitty aesthetic of the game really turned a lot of people who played games like Grand Theft Auto and Saints Row and True Crime series off to this style of game. They wanted something more gritty and realistic and Lego City Undercover was essentially looked at as a Grand Theft Auto for kids. But I don't really think it is a Grand Theft Auto for kids. I think it's a fantastic open world experience that more people need to experience. So if you own a system where LEGO City Undercover is available on it, definitely pick up this game. It's pretty cheap nowadays and you're going to have a lot of fun with it. In my opinion, and a lot of other people's opinions, the Xbox One lacks a lot of single-player narrative-driven games, and that's unfortunate because a lot of these games are very popular. And there was a game that actually sold very well on the Xbox One that was a single-player narrative-driven game that I absolutely loved. But once again, nobody ever really talks about this game, and that is Quantum Break. Now, Quantum Break is done by the team that did Alan Wake on the Xbox 360, which was a fantastic sort of sci-fi horror-based game. But Quantum Break is a bit different. It feels more like a mod modern television series in which you play as a character named Jack Joyce who basically must master different abilities and put things in a company called Monarch Solutions that's basically trying to take over the world into perspective and take out these people. It sort of blends real world elements and sci-fi elements into a TV basic presentation where you have actual live actors playing out different scenes in between different narratives of the game. The game is really fast and frantic. There's a lot of different elements going on. There's time travel, time control, of course there's gunplay as well. It's a beautiful looking game and it's just a really solid game on the Xbox One. So why is this game a bit underrated? Well, although it did sell pretty well on the Xbox One, we have to remember the Xbox One definitely struggled out of the gate. And while things got better with subsequent updates of the system like the Xbox One S and the Xbox One X, really games didn't sell all that great on the Xbox One when they first came out. And Quantum Break was an early game in the Xbox One's life cycle. But that doesn't mean it's a bad game. It's actually one of the best games on the Xbox One and definitely a game that more people need to experience. If you own an Xbox One, you really owe it to yourself to pick up this game. You can pick it up for super cheap, and if you enjoy single player narrative driven games, you're going to have a lot of fun with this game. The final game I want to talk about was the inspiration for this video. I was going to do a full video dedicated to it, but I felt like, you know what, I want to talk about some other underrated games as well. But this was a GameCube game that came out very early in the GameCube's life cycle. It's looked back on very fondly, but when it initially released, it was not looked at fondly, and that is Luigi's Mansion. Now, Luigi's Mansion was unlike anything we had seen from Nintendo at this time. You basically control Luigi, who's trying to save Mario, who goes to a haunted mansion and disappears. So you have to find Mario, and basically the game 
gameplay is unlike anything that we had seen within the Mario universe at this time. Instead of platforming and doing things like that, or a Super Mario 64 thing where it's a big open world and you're running and doing platforming and jumping from place to place, you don't do any of that in this game. You have the Poltergust 3000 and you use that to suck up ghosts. And basically, it was just such a weird game, especially coming to us from Nintendo, that a lot of people just did not appreciate this game. People wanted a game like Super Mario 64 at the early life cycle of the Nintendo GameCube. But honestly, this game was probably a better fit for the Nintendo GameCube as it was super unique. It's still an amazing looking game. There are definite elements of a bit of horror in the game as well. It's not a scary game or anything like that, but it's definitely a bit of a darker game than you usually see from Nintendo. The portrait ghosts are really unique in how they're basically mini puzzles and how you have to solve them in order to basically suck them up into your Poltergust 3000. And there's a lot of replay value in this game as well, just because of the way it really plays out and just how much fun it is. Luigi's Mansion obviously is getting a lot of press right now with Luigi's Mansion 3, but if you've never played Luigi's Mansion on the GameCube, I definitely recommend checking it out. Many reviewers at the time were just not satisfied with this style of game, and that's why this game sort of flies under the radar. They wanted that Super Mario 64 feeling instead of a new, new unique IP from Nintendo, but I think this was absolutely the right decision. It's one of the most underrated games of all time and definitely a must play. All right, so those were 11 games that I feel are severely underrated for a multitude of systems. You probably have one of these systems, so go ahead and check out these games. But let me know in the comments section down below if you're familiar with any of these versions of the games. Have you played these games before? And do you feel that they're underrated? And maybe what are some underrated games to you? And as always, guys, thank you for checking out this video. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. Make sure you guys check out the description box down below as well for various links. If you want to get your hands on the new Big If True shirt, yes, I actually made a Big If True shirt because I don't know, it's just kind of funny. Make sure you guys check out the merchandise link in the description box down below, along with the Facebook and the Twitter page to so follow me on there. And as always, I will catch you guys on the next video. Later.